In 1848, there were just 55 Chinese men living in the United States. When gold was discovered in California, that number skyrocketed to over 150,000 in just a couple of years. In the decades that followed, they would transform the American frontier and the Canadian and Mexican frontiers as well. The story of the Chinese in North America is a tragic one in many ways, but also one of resilience. This is the forbidden secret lives of the Chinese on the American frontier. Setting Sail it's not quite clear exactly how word of the California gold rush reached China. According to one account, a merchant named Chum Ming struck it rich in the Sierra Nevada foothills and rode to a friend back home, spreading the news. Another account says that in late 1848, a ship arrived in Hong Kong carrying California gold dust that was on its way to an evaluation by British experts. The ship also brought a Honolulu newspaper reporting massive quantities of gold being found. Soon, word spread through the Pearl River Delta region of southeastern China, even though leaving the country was then illegal. Still though, men started booking passage to Gold Mountain, as they called it, mostly paying their own way like other prospectors. The 10- to 12-week voyages were miserable, overcrowded and disease-ridden with high mortality. Passengers usually only had dried fish and rice to eat. Anyone who didn't survive was tossed overboard. It was a perilous journey. Still might prefer it to take in a carnival cruise, though. A missionary named William Spear, who treated a lot of the sick passengers who were arriving in San Francisco, wrote that there was no excuse before God or man for the terrible mortality which had occurred on some of the vessels containing Chinese passengers. In 1849, about 325 Chinese passed through San Francisco. By 1852, over 20,000 arrived, making up 10% of the state's population. Part of the reason so many Chinese people started flooding into California was because of the political situation in their homeland. The Qing Dynasty was in shambles and would crumble completely by 1911. The Taiping Rebellion, which lasted from 1850 to 1864, cost upwards of 10 million lives. The two Opium Wars between 1839 and 1860 saw Great Britain cripple China's economy. Floods and famine were common. The whole situation was enough for some to risk the journey and try to set up a new life in the United States. Tainted Gold as increasing numbers of Chinese came seeking gold, resentment from white miners grew. In the spring of 1852 in Colombia in the Sierra Nevada area, a meeting of miners approved resolutions denouncing what they called the flooding of California with degraded Asiatics and banning Chinese from local mining claims. Around then, along the American River, a few dozen white miners violently drove off 200 Chinese miners, chasing them from their dig sites. Flush from their success, the group headed to another Chinese mining camp, accompanied triumphantly by a band playing music where they expelled 400 more Chinese living there. Things would get worse a little over two decades later. By 1877, the United States was in the midst of the so-called Long Depression, and unemployment was over 20% in San Francisco. So, on July 24th, a group of disgruntled laborers and miners decided to riot. First, the Beale Street Wharf was set on fire, destroying over a half million dollars worth of property and goods. But that was only a diversion to draw police to the scene and distract from the riot forming near Chinatown. Crowds gathered and burned Chinese-owned businesses, destroying $100,000 worth of Chinese-owned property and killing four Chinese immigrants. In the aftermath, things got even worse. Levi's, which had employed 186 Chinese laborers the previous year, fired all of them and started employing only citizen workers. And then there was a rivalry with the Irish. Many Irish immigrants were heavily involved in a non-Chinese movement. As the Irish started flooding into the country during the Great Famine of the 1840s, they faced their own discrimination and they were not happy with being in the same group as the Chinese immigrants. One of the first official examples of this was the Foreign Miners Tax of 1850, which taxed all foreign miners $20 a month to mine for gold and grouped the Chinese and Irish together. It was also common to see signs in cities that read Irish need not apply. The ultimate slap in the face came in 1882 when President Chester A. Arthur signed the Chinese Exclusion Act. The act made it illegal for Chinese to immigrate to the U.S. for 10 years, with special exceptions for some residents, specialized workers, and diplomats. It also made it impossible for Chinese to get citizenship. The laws would remain on the books for the next 60 years. Tong Wars like many conflicts throughout history, the Tong Wars were kind of started over a woman, or for the gangs of Chinatowns across the country, the lack of women. By the late 1800s, there were far more male Chinese immigrants than females. 
A big reason why was the Page Law of 1875. It was one of the earliest legislative efforts aimed specifically at limiting the immigration of Chinese women. Officially titled the Act to Prohibit the Coming of Chinese Laborers to the United States, it was basically designed to keep women from coming into the country for immoral purposes. Some of the most powerful tongs were in San Francisco. You had the Hop Sing Tong, the Sui Sing Tong, the Hip Sing Tong, the Bing Kong Tong, the Four Brothers Tong, the Sam Yup Company Tong, and the On Leong Tong, among others. To complicate things, people could be members of multiple tongs at once. So if a member of one tong stole a member of another tong's girl, the members of a third or fourth tong could be dragged into the resulting violence and you'd have a three or four tong war on your hands. The tong members were slinking around on rooftops. People were getting off in theaters for allegedly stealing a rival member's seat. In New York City, there were two guys vying for supremacy and the supremacy of the respective tongs. Mock Duck, the leader of the Hip Song Tong, and Tom Lee, the head of the On Leon Tong. Mock Duck was notorious for a bad temper and a flamboyant personality. He often paraded around Chinatown with his entourage of bodyguards wearing chain mail under his clothes to protect himself from assassination attempts. Tom Lee was a bit more strategic. He wielded his power through connections with New York politicians and law enforcement, eventually earning him a reputation as the unofficial mayor of Chinatown. His influence extended beyond the criminal underworld, allowing the On Leong Tong to basically operate with impunity. The warfare between the Hip Sing and the O Leong Tongs was intense. There were assassination attempts and street battles that often involved so-called hatchet men or high binders. These were hired assassins known for their devastating use of hatchets. These conflicts could sometimes be about personal vendettas. The violence got so bad that it ended up spilling over into the rest of the city and was finally cracked down on towards the end of the 1800s. One of San Francisco Chinatown's original gangsters was a guy named Little Pete. Little Pete became enormously wealthy and one of the most famous figures in all of Chinatown by the 1880s and 90s. Now, Little Pete had a fierce rivalry with another major Chinatown gang leader named Big Jim, who wanted Little Pete dead. This rivalry led to 33-year-old Little Pete's demise in 1897. His funeral was a Chinatown extravaganza, basically similar to a state dignitary's funeral. A black horse-drawn hearse carried Pete's casket through Chinatown streets, followed by dozens of carriages. Colorful silk banners with Chinese characters declared Pete's community status and achievements and waved alongside the procession route. The ceremony included offerings of food, candles, and incense burning according to Chinese tradition to usher in good fortune in the afterlife. The rites reflected a mingling of Chinese spiritual customs with a show of Pete's prominence as a Chinese-American crime boss. In the aftermath, Tong Wars raged on for years following Pete's death as others vied to claim his lucrative criminal empire and control in the San Francisco underworld but none matched the mix of reverence, fear, and awe Chinatown had for its original gangster legend, Little Pete. Nefarious Activity One way for Chinese immigrants to bypass the Exclusion Act of 1882 was to be a merchant or a performer. So many gangsters like Little Pete started having fake papers drawn up for women and often girls to be brought over claiming they were actors or acrobats or singers and things like that. Little Pete brought hundreds of women into the country in this way for San Francisco's Midwinter Fair of 1884. But these women didn't perform at the fair. They performed elsewhere. The fate of these women was tragic. They became Daughters of Joy, a pleasant sounding nickname for a horrible thing. Concubine women were rampant throughout the Chinatowns across the frontier and particularly in San Francisco. When 24 Chinese women entered the port of San Francisco, papers said they were merchant wives and daughters. The New York Times scoffed, writing, they are, however, nothing of the sort. The Chinese slave trade is a growing business. Girls are bought from their parents for $100 to $300 on the promise that they will be brought here and married. On their arrival, they pass through the habeas corpus mill and are disposed of for $1,500 or $2,000 and placed in disreputable houses. Concubine girls who didn't speak English were told horror stories about abusive conditions if they tried to find help from Christian rescue missions. In truth, the missions couldn't really provide much protection anyway, since escaped girls risked being caught and forced into being concubines once again by Chinese gangs or anti-Chinese mobs looking for work. Just attending church could be dangerous. If a girl ran away, concubine ringleaders would use corrupt lawyers and police to block her escape and send her back to the brothels. Some had contracts taken out against them for trying to get help. Any rescue efforts were dashed by the fact that these brothels often changed locations and had deep pockets to pay bribes. Even powerful Chinese civic groups trying to help would be abruptly shut down by those in the business. Mexican Badlands 
On one of the hottest days of summer in 1902, a group of 42 Chinese migrant workers sailed from Sinaloa, Mexico to a small fishing village in Baja, California, Mexico. They had struggled to find work in Sinaloa and heard there were new agricultural developments and jobs in the Mexicali area, just across the California border. The group still had to journey across 100 miles of harsh desert terrain to reach Mexicali. With no money for transportation, they planned to make the journey on foot. Far from home in a foreign land, the migrants hired a local unemployed fisherman to guide them across the desert for almost nothing. Unfortunately, the guide didn't actually know the route well or realize how lethal the conditions would really be. As they walked on in the hopes of better opportunity, the scorching heat took its toll. By the end, only eight members of the group made it through the desert alive. The area where so many perished along the journey came to be called the Desert of the Chinese or El Desierto de los Chinos by locals. Chinese immigrants didn't just face hardships in the U.S. From the 1880s into the 1920s, they were Mexico's fastest growing immigrant population, growing from less than 2,000 in 1895 to 20,000 by 1920. Many of these Chinese men who immigrated to Mexico ended up marrying local women in order to assimilate into Mexican society. Many also converted to Catholicism and adopted Christian names in the hopes they could gain a stronger sense of belonging to the land and community. But resentment and fear of economic competition from Chinese immigrants led to an emerging anti-Chinese movement during the Mexican Revolution, which got even worse during the Great Depression. Probably the worst incident came in 1911 when a faction of Pancho Villa's army killed over 300 Chinese people in Toron, a full half of the Chinese population in the town. This horrific violence eventually culminated in mass deportations of the Chinese and Chinese-Mexican population in the 1930s, expelling nearly 70% of this community from Mexico entirely. Mystery Tunnels With so many Chinese immigrants faced with mistreatment on the streets of cities across the United States, many are rumored to have taken refuge underground. Many towns on the American frontier have secret networks of tunnels beneath them, dug out for seedy illegal operations, allegedly. One of these networks lay beneath the frontier town of Pendleton, Oregon. The Pendleton underground tunnels were basically a hidden part of the city, built and used by Chinese immigrants. Again, this is speculation. These tunnels house operations that would definitely not have been accepted on the surface. Gambling halls and even seedier spaces where concubines or day laborers were sold. Miners, cowboys, and even local lawmen might have made their way down to get in on some of the action. The gambling areas would have been busy. Patrons might have been playing games like Fantan or Pai Gao under dim lighting. These spots, often controlled by the tongs we just talked about, were important parts of the underground economy that was making gangsters like Little Pete rich. But we don't know for sure whether the underground tunnels of Pendleton and other frontier towns, tunnels which definitely exist, were actually used for this kind of stuff. Most of this is local legend and anecdotal. Train Wreck Between 1863 and 1869, 15,000 Chinese workers made building the Transcontinental Railroad possible. Without them, the western part of the railway, the Central Pacific Line, and particularly the stretch through the rugged Sierra Nevada mountains, probably wouldn't have been built. They were paid half the wages of white workers and had to live in tents while their white co-workers slept in the train cars. They shoveled 20 pounds of rock 400 times a day. They perished in avalanches and dynamite mishaps, but we really don't know the true extent of the death toll. Some estimate around 1,200 died during the railway's construction, but that number is certainly higher. Many of the dead were simply dumped in unmarked graves along the tracks and forgotten about. In 1864, workers on the Central Pacific were struggling to make it through the Sierra Nevada mountains, and the vision of a transcontinental railway was quickly falling apart. Most of the Caucasian labor force in the region was busy searching for gold, so a railroad magnate named Charles Crocker decided to bring in reinforcements. In February of 1865, a flat car took 50 Chinese workers to the construction site. The next day, they worked 12 hours straight. Crocker was ecstatic. In a few months, the number of Chinese laborers grew to 3,000. A few months later, it doubled to 6,000. These Chinese immigrants would do the jobs that no one else would even think about attempting to do. They hung from ropes dangling from the edges of cliffs. They blasted tunnels with nitroglycerin, an explosive liquid that no one else would touch. They seemingly had boundless courage and boundless energy. Now, a big reason for the energy part was their diet. While many of these white workers ate stale meat and drank whiskey, these Chinese immigrants were dining on oysters and cuttlefish shipped in from San Francisco. They ate rice, they ate vegetables, sometimes grown in little gardens along the way, and they drank lots of tea instead of lots of whiskey. By 1869, 90% of the laborers working on the railway were Chinese, and on April 27th of that year, they laid 10 miles of new track in just one day. 
a record at the time. Tragically, we don't know who these workers were. They've been lost to history. At the official ceremony celebrating the connection of the two lines in Promontory, Utah, they were left completely out of the cameras as they recorded the wealthy railroad tycoons driving in the last spike. The Citrus Wizard Well, we do know who one of them was at least. He survived the perilous railway work and went on to become one of the main reasons Americans today are able to eat oranges all year long. Louis Gim Gong was born in 1860 in the Guangdong province of China and immigrated to the U.S. when he was 12. First, he worked in a shoe factory in Massachusetts, where he suffered the long hours and harsh conditions typical of most immigrants at the time. Looking for something better, Louis moved to the frontier and joined up with the thousands of Chinese immigrants who were building the Transcontinental Railroad. Despite all the dangers of the railway work, Louis survived. After his stint on the railroad, he moved to Florida in the 1880s and entered the world of agriculture, working for a wealthy horticulturist named Fanny Law. Under Law's mentorship, Louis got really into plant breeding, and specifically citrus fruits, which were becoming big business in Florida at the time. He eventually became known as the Citrus Wizard. Louis Gim Gong developed a frost-resistant variety of orange that could thrive in the cooler climates of central Florida. It extended the growing season and had a huge impact on the state's citrus industry. The variety, which became known as the Louis Gimgong Orange, was a hybrid between a Mediterranean sweet orange and a tangerine. Louis also successfully developed a seedless grapefruit and a bunch of other fruit varieties. Canadian Railway Things didn't get much easier for the 6,500 Chinese immigrants who ventured north to work on the Canadian Pacific Railway in the 1880s. It's estimated that one worker died for each mile of track that was laid through the mountains between Calgary and Vancouver. Just like in the United States, these Chinese workers were paid half of what their white counterparts were making. At a dollar a day, they still had to put some of that money towards their own food and drink, while provisions for the Caucasian workers were included in their wages. And just like in Promontory, Utah, the Chinese workers were cleared from view at the last spike ceremony in Krigalaki, British Columbia, so photographers could get a picture without them. And just like in the United States, Canadian legislators started cracking down hard on Chinese immigration. In 1900, Canada doubled the entry fee for Chinese immigrants from $50 to $100. Then it started a head tax in 1903, which they had to pay an extra $500 for their heads to be allowed in the country, I guess. The restrictions worked. In 1904, 5,000 Chinese immigrants entered Canada. The next year, that number was only eight. Then in 1907, a riot broke out outside Vancouver City Hall. 30,000 people showed up for a rally against Chinese immigration, a full half of the entire city's population. Many of them were wearing ribbons that prompted for a non-Asian Canada. Over the next three days, Vancouver's Chinatown was ransacked and Chinese homes and businesses destroyed. Then, just like in the U.S., Canada passed its own version of the Chinese Exclusion Act. In 1923, all Chinese immigration was banned and it would stay that way for the next 25 years. Chinese and Native Americans As more Chinese immigrants flocked to the frontier, they inevitably came into contact with Native Americans. Sometimes these interactions went well, but other times they went horribly wrong. At first, there seemed to be some mutual fascination and curiosity between the two groups, who wondered if they shared common ancestral ties. There's a documented case of a miner named Wang Ying who, when first seen a Native American, wondered if they shared a similar ethnic background. And there actually have been studies supporting a genetic link between East Asians and Native Americans. After all, the people who populated the Americas came from the Asian continent, either via the Bering Land Bridge or by coast hopping in small boats. Economic interactions between Chinese and Native Americans went down in both cooperative and competitive ways. They worked together fishing and in canneries, but also competed for jobs like laundry work and hop picking, and sometimes this competition could lead to violence. One account describes there was also illegal trade. Now, it was a crime to sell Native Americans alcohol in many parts of the country, and getting caught would land the Chinese middlemen in jail, or with a substantial hole in their wallets. There was also a whole lot of deception and violence. Native Americans extorted miners taxes from Chinese miners, and sometimes kidnapped or robbed them. Not to be out extorted, Chinese miners often pay Native Americans with fake gold. Thanks for watching Nutty History. If you love this kind of frontier content, like and share the video with someone who would too. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring that bell to keep up to date with all the videos about the nutty side of human history.